All right, can you guys see these? No, right? All righty, now we've got the slides up, right? Everybody can see our my lovely first slide. All right. So as uh, people start logging on, um, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Emma Lloyd. I'm the Director of Policy and Programs for the Executives for Health Innovation. We are so excited to have you guys here today for our expert recommendations, building and sustaining a modern public health system. Uh, it's going to be a great conversation and we are, we're hoping you guys can really get into that chat and send us some cute questions for the speakers as we go. Um, I'll get started in just one minute, but in the meantime, I would love to hear where you guys are all calling in from. I am calling in from uh, Arlington, right next to where the uh, Amazon Spire is going to be. So I can see lots of construction for something very beautiful that's coming. Um, what about you guys, Amanda? Hi, I am calling in from St. Petersburg, Florida, where we are a very chilly 90 degrees here today. Awesome, awesome. And Craig and Felicia, you guys are both in Maryland, right? Yeah, I'm in Columbia. It is not very picturesque, but at least it's sunny. And I am in Bowie, Maryland. I believe it's also 90 degrees outside. <laughs> Beautiful and 90. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, last thing, if you're from New Hampshire, I want to hear about it because I grew up in New Hampshire and I always have to shout it out. So if you are, put it in the chat and I'll see you later. All right. Uh, I'm going to get us started today. So again, I am Emma Valinsky. Emma Lloyd, sorry. I just changed my name. I just got married. Emma Lloyd, the Director of Policy and Programs for the Executives for Health Innovation. And um, today our webinar is uh, Expert Recommendations, Building and Sustaining a Modern Public Health System. So uh, we are EHI, Executives for Health Innovation. Like I said, we are a small but very mighty nonprofit in Washington, DC. I'd say our main job is to convene experts and executives together. We uh, start conversation and facilitate meetings to hopefully come to solutions and best practices to some of the biggest health IT problems today. Also, we do a lot of education, which is why you are on a webinar today with us. We do a lot of webinars and briefings and roundtables. We hope that you guys can learn a lot from this. And um, yeah, so that's, we like to bring everybody together for, currently, these are our four focus areas, which, I think we we're going to touch on all of them today in our uh, in our webinar. We are looking into uh, virtual care, privacy and security, health equity, and modernizing public health. You'll see a lot of educational materials and webinars coming from uh, EHI based on these areas, but also across the health IT industry. You'll see here. This is our list of executives. EHI is a membership organization with uh healthcare uh companies from all across the industry so big to small all different types if you see your name on here and you want to get involved if your company is here and you want to get involved feel free to reach out we would love to meet you and work with you guys if you don't see your name on here we're very we're very fun and we're very great and we would love for you guys to also get involved and so you can also put that your name and everything in the chat and we can reach out to you guys. I also think that uh, Bianca will be putting a uh, link so you can also check it out on our website. Also on our website, like I said, we like to be a resource, an educational resource. So you will find our executive resource center where it has briefings and letters and comments and webinars. You'll see actually the recording for this webinar You'll find that there later today as well. So you can find everything you're, everything you're looking for on health IT and solutions on our Executive Resource Center. So uh, briefly, what brings us all here today, EHI started a task force uh, at the end of 2021 because we really wanted to hear from our members and hear from uh, hear what they were seeing was the biggest challenges in public health modernization, 
uh, especially after COVID. We wanted to hear what they had learned and where we should go from here. You'll find on that Executive Resource Center all of the uh, recordings for all of these uh, webinars, including stuff about the, what the pandemic exposed, data privacy, public health, and well, really public and health equity. Uh, so we are going to touch on uh, what was in our report, which I believe we'll also be putting in the chat so you guys can review that. And uh, also we're going to talk about uh, real life experiences, what everyone's seeing out there. So I guess I will introduce Amanda Patnow, partner at uh, Coda LLC, also our fantastic policy analyst. So I will just let you take over. Thanks so much, Emma, and thanks everybody for being here today. So, you know, like Emma said, the EHI task force um, for um, modernizing public health got together and really looked at the situation and said, you know, based on EHI's focused areas around technology and data in particular, what can we identify as our key areas of concern? for our public health system and what are some key recommendations. In a nutshell, the concerns came down to one, a number of our systems are considerably outdated and two, um, they're quite fragmented. And in fact, Nikki Tripathi from ONC um, said at HIMSS in 2021 that our public health system suffers from not really being a system, which is one of the challenges that we have. And it's a really loosely cobbled constellation of systems fragmented in a number of different ways. So under that lens and through a great deal of collaboration, the task force came up with a few recommendations regarding what a fully health IT enabled public health system might look like. And a few of those key areas of recommendations fell around policy transparency, promoting health equity and facilitating collaboration which is exactly why we're here today. And so on that note, I would love to introduce our speakers. We have with us today, Craig Bem, the Maryland Executive Director of CRIS, Dr. Felicia McCalla, Director of Operations for the AAMC Center for Health Justice, and our very own Brad Walters, Director of Federal Government Relations at Marshfield Clinic Health System. And so this morning, we're going to welcome each of our speakers to give us just a few minute overview of exactly um, what each of them are seeing. And we'll start with you, please, Dr. McCalla, to give us a little bit of an overview of the Center for Health Justice and uh, what you've seen in regards to um, what the pandemic revealed to us about our current data infrastructure and what the connections are there around um, data and health equity. Sure. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Dr. Felicia McCalla and I serve as the Director of Operations for the AAMC Center for Health Justice. It is truly an honor to speak with you today and to share an overview of the Center for Health Justice, as well as the connection between public health and data collection and how it affects health equity. At the AAMC Center for Health Justice, we believe that every community should have an equitable chance of being healthy, and we remind ourselves often that health equity is our goal and health justice is the path that gets us there. Health equity is about communities, not individuals, about populations and not single patients one at a time. And this is important because it demands that our interventions and strategies have impact at the population level and not only at the individual level. Health equity is also about beginnings, not endings, about opportunities and not outcomes. If we create authentic health opportunities for our communities, more equitable outcomes will follow. At the AAMC, we've operationalized a health justice framework that has one foot place in community wisdom and multi-sector partnerships, recognizing that those closest to injustice are also those closest to the solutions of that injustice. The other foot is planted in a research to policy action imperative that includes policies at all level, federal, state, local, and organizational. 
We then use both feet to walk towards health justice in an anti-racist, anti-discriminatory way to address the social, racial, and economic injustice that is the fundamental cause of health inequities. We are deploying that framework across our four focus areas, one focus area being data for health equity. Within this focus area, our objectives are to develop tools and advocate for the information we need to ensure communities thrive. In the COVID-19 pandemic, it has revealed the gaps of our current data infrastructure. Often health data, health information on race and ethnicity is missing or unreliable. There is no standard way to collect individual data such as I am experiencing homelessness, for example, or community social risk data, for example, my community lacks affordable housing. Get alone share that data across sectors to coordinate, align, and evaluate efforts. Improving community health requires accurate and relevant data to identify population health inequities, develop locally relevant interventions, and track progress towards health equity. The AAMC Center for Health Justice is committed to ensuring that the United States has the data it needs to achieve health equity. So we strive to one, engage the health justice community, two, build evidence and share expertise, and three, ease the path to health equity. One way that we engage the health justice community in data collection is through AAMC CHARGE, which stands for Collaborative for Health Equity Act, research, generate evidence. CHARGE is an interpersonal and cross-disciplinary group of health equity scholars and champions across the country. The group gathers to facilitate and advance collaborative research policy and programmatic evidence-based solutions to health inequities. They also share accomplishments, crowdsource opportunities for professional development, and collaborate on policy work that impacts health equity at institutional, local, state, and federal levels. To build evidence and share expertise related to public health data, our center conducts nationally represented polling to ask the public about health equity issues that matter to them. We then release research briefs to share what communities have to say about their own opportunities for health. And so to date, we have completed three polls. The first poll was on trustworthiness. We polled a nationally representative sample of adults across the United States to gauge their levels of trust in institutions, how that trust has changed over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, and what organizations should do to be seen as a trustworthy partner by their communities. Most people polled overwhelmingly trusted their neighborhood fire departments, businesses, and pharmacies to treat all people fairly. The answer to the question of who people trusted least is a bit more complicated. We found that the more money a person makes, the more likely they were to trust. There were also racial and ethnic patterns of trust. Hispanic people were more, had more trust across all sectors than Black people. White people had the most trust across all sectors. When asked about how their trust had changed since the start of the pandemic, again, the differences, the largest difference was by income. Those whose income was smallest reported greater net loss in trust. When asked open questions about what these sectors could do to earn their trust, respondents' answers were very direct. One respondent said, for starters, come to us and ask us first. Others urge organizations to be consistent and to live up to their own stated goals. But the most touched upon theme was for institutions to just tell the truth. For the second poll, we explore the connections between public trust in institutions and willingness to share personal health data. Many adults believe their personal information is being collected and shared and concerns about this sharing are consistently high across clinical, demographic, social, and online footprint data. 
A person's comfort level with their data being shared was also found to vary dependent on the recipient of the data, with more adults willing to share healthcare with health healthcare providers and state and local public health agencies, as opposed to entities such as insurers or corporations. Adults are more willing to share their information with all entities if identifiable information is removed. Many are mixed on the impact of sharing their information. And this finding suggests that at a baseline, many adults are not aware of the opportunities that can come from sharing information about themselves. Engagement with communities around their concerns and the potential benefits of data sharing may be a key component in increasing acceptance within communities and also diversifying the individuals represented in data sets. The third poll focused on the experiences of birthing people in the United States and asked questions regarding their pregnancy, birth, and postpartum experiences. I encourage you to check out this research brief on our website and I'll drop the link in the chat and also it's associated polling spotlight that highlights findings within the LGBTQ plus community. We share this spotlight as part of our efforts to examine the perspectives of marginalized communities as we seek to build an inclusive health justice movement. Continue to check out our our website as we release new polls on topics such as civic engagement individual environmental justice and transgender health. And lastly, to ease the path to health equity, the Center for Health Justice has partnered with Vanderbilt University Medical Center to enhance our health equity inventory tool. This tool will allow AAMC member institutions to capture and report information on community re relevant work across their organizations. It will also foster better internal and external collaboration and coordination and increase efficiency and impact of health equity focused projects, programs, and partnerships. It will also give the AAMC better real-time insight into members' community collaboration work. We are currently piloting this tool with five member institutions and the plan is to release the tool to the public in 2024. If you are interested in the AAMC Center for Health Justice, there are several ways you can stay in touch. You can check out our website. There you'll find all the initiatives, that, the initiatives and programs I discussed today and more. You can email us at healthjustice at aamc.org. For those on Twitter, you can follow the center at AAMC Justice. And finally, you can sign up for the Center for Health Justice newsletter. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCullough. I love what you said that uh, health equity is about communities, not individuals, about populations and not single patients one at a time. And that it's important because it demands that our interventions and strategies have impact at the population level and not only at the individual level. I think that's really great, thank you. And a reminder to all of our attendees to please feel free to drop your questions in the chat or Q&A and um, we will take those um, at, um, as we move along here today. Um, so next up, would love to uh, hear from Craig Bim, uh, a little bit of an overview of what's happening at CRISP and the role that it's playing in public health. Hey, Craig, you're on mute. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for calling out my mute. Uh, I think I'd be better at that by now. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, so just a quick overview on CRISP. We are the Health Information Exchange here in Maryland. Uh, we also work with other HIEs around the country uh, on just collaborative activities, shared infrastructure, uh, things we think can move, kind of local governance of healthcare data and direct relationship with providers uh, forward across the country. Um, you know, it's been an interesting process for us because as an HIE, uh, as hopefully all of you know, you know, we are very good at moving data from point to point. And traditionally, uh, we would go and talk about use cases around, you know, patient presents to emergency department, and you could see care team relationships and past visits and all sorts of really useful results and orders and different things. And um, that's great. That's, that's great infrastructure. It's very necessary across uh, many of our organizations. Um, when it came to public health, uh, we did very little. Um, as, a, 
as a nonprofit, we certainly wanted to support our state partners and our nonprofit partners. Uh, we wanted to support patients and consumers, um, but we really did not do much more than kind of providing the pipes for certain data to flow uh, to make it a little easier for folks. And then before the pandemic, a few years ago, uh, we were asked to become the prescription drug monitoring program in the state of Maryland. And a lot of the themes, uh, which maybe didn't strike me as much at the time, um, have really turned out to be um, you know, somewhat forward thinking. And so we were asked to be the PDMP because we already had a place that registered tens of thousands of users to access clinical data. Uh, we already had the privacy security protocols, uh, which we're always updating, but are certainly uh, important from a baseline perspective. And we were already a place that individuals went to access important clinical information. And so it seemed natural for the HIE to also then be a conduit for the PDMP data. Um, as the pandemic came, I think what we learned is those exact same things hold true. Uh, we're really good at, at role-based access, privacy security, multi-factor authentication, all the things you would need to deal with sensitive data. And so it became natural when someone said, well, you know, we need to upload more lab results from kind of different actors, whether they're new labs being set up or, or individual sites doing uh, results. Um, CRISP made sense for that. And we were more than happy to, to do our best and, and work with it. Um, so through use cases like that, our, our role within public health grew. And um, one way we describe ourselves now is really as a health data utility. Um, and the concept there is that having all of the data flow into a central place uh, that has all the governance and protections uh, that I mentioned, um, but also the capabilities to link the data, uh, check it for quality, and then provide it back to other users uh, is just invaluable, um, not only because of all the use cases that, that have to do with exchange, um, but really because we can then make all the data that much more valuable. Um, so for example, some of the new services we started doing were things like looking at the immunization records from the state, running them through our master person index and indicating back where they might have singletons or merge issues. Uh, it's a core capability that we have. It's something we do for, for many, many millions of lives in our MPI. And by having their data, we could run that service for them. Now, because we had their data, we could also make it available at the point of care in our tools um, or make it available in bulk to appropriate users if they wanted to do outreach programs. Uh, and so we're starting to see just the exponential value increase by having the data uh, through this one single structure. Uh, maybe another example that's uh, good to share is uh, contact tracing. Uh, of course, when contact tracers reach out, they want to use the best possible phone number, they want to make sure the person's not hospitalized. They certainly uh, want to make sure the person didn't pass away. And um, because of other use cases and data use agreements and our participation agreements, we have all that data. And so we could then link uh, another phone number or fill in a phone number uh, for contact tracers. Uh, maybe most importantly, we also have access to things like demographic data, such as race, ethnicity, and address. And so if we were starting to look at the distribution of vaccines, uh, we could help the state look at it in terms of health equity and access, not just in the logistical operational metrics that they could do in their normal distribution channels. Uh, it's probably really important to mention, we by no means are policymakers. Uh, we also want to be very careful uh, to do no harm as we do these processes. So we by no means are claiming to be, you know, the quote, source of truth for race or ethnicity. Uh, but what we are is a group that has a lot of data and we can work with, for example, our Office on Minority Health and Health Disparities to say, this is what we're seeing in the data. How best can we use it and provide it to different groups in a way that's sensitive and appropriate? Um, of course, what comes up is the matter of sensitive data, uh, and and certainly some data is more sensitive than others, and then the use cases make it make it even more sensitive. Um, you know, there were some some serious challenges. We're all used to uh, substance use disorder, and of course, the PDMP uh, is incredibly sensitive, and we have really really firm and thoughtful permissions behind that. Um, but there are some new sensitivities that maybe we didn't anticipate, like when the 
public health officials want a list of all children who have not been vaccinated. Uh, while that's maybe not sensitive in the same way that substance use disorder data is or covered by special laws, they certainly have no right to access any of that data. That's not theirs. And so uh, working through this, this health data utility concept really started with governance and appropriate permissions and determining uh, what is the process through which we can make sure that every user gets all of the data they're allowed to have access to but no more. And I think it's gonna become a really efficient system uh, for, again, permitted users. Um, and it's gonna be a really efficient way to make sure that we can aggregate data and provide it for different purposes. Um, but we have to always get that right. And that's gonna be really critical for us. Um, maybe I'll end with just some kind of unique things that I think uh, we and, and other organizations like us can start doing. Um, so I mentioned that we were linking data sets together for things like Immunet to clean up their data. Um, we also, I think, have the, the capability to maybe uh, support the state as certain backups to different systems. Uh, we do a lot of the same, we have a lot of the same infrastructure the state has for things like uh, a lab reporting interface. And in some cases, we want to avoid duplication because we want to be efficient and, and reuse technology as appropriate. In other cases, maybe we'll, we'll look for redundancy. So we all have backups and, and can keep critical data flowing uh, if something should happen to either system. Um, we also are starting to work with new types of organizations and only as appropriate, um, but public schools are a great example of uh, users of Immunet who have to query one person at a time. And if we can, uh, we have demonstrated, we can do bulk queries of the same data and essentially provide lists of people that are much more uh, workable to the end users. And so we're really excited to work with our state and our partners to explore all these new ways that data uh, can be linked and leveraged appropriately um, and shared. And, um, and I will maybe note, I keep on using words like all the data and I'm um, very cognizant that no group should have maybe all the data. Um, and we are standing up a consumer advisory council to go along with an HIE policy board and our various governance committees, uh, because as more and more data and more and more types of data uh, and more and more technology allows you to do new things, um, we want to be really, really mindful that we're doing the right things. And, um, and that's really what our focus has been, I think, going to be for, for a very long time. Uh, so that was a bunch of examples, but um, I will turn it back over and look forward to the, the Q&A. All right. Thanks so much, Craig. And um, I think that the increased collaboration across HIEs and agencies um, for shared infrastructure that you mentioned is exactly what the task force was talking about when they envisioned a, a health IT enabled public health system. So thank you for sharing that for sure. And um, so next up, the other component that we're talking about today is around um, policies and policy transparency. Uh, Brad Walters would love to hear from you about how the pandemic has changed the political landscape around public health legislation. Sure, um, Amanda, thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, at least uh, from some of the listeners. Um, I apologize I can't be there on video today, but um, I'm really pleased to be here. And I am, I should say, I probably wear two hats in my discussion here today. Um, first with the Marshall Clinic Health System, an um, uh, integrated health system for serving a primarily rural population in uh, Northern and Central Wisconsin. And then also as the uh, uh, chair of the EHI PSC. Um, so I'm excited to be here in both roles. Um, just building off of what my, both my colleagues mentioned um, prior to this is, I would say, you know, I think the key themes are getting the information to the right people at the right time. Um, and I'll be very frank, I'm using, wearing my health system hat, I think we learned, especially, um, you know, my colleagues um, on the front lines um, at our health system, and I think a lot of uh, other areas around the country at the time was that there is no unification, there is no work um, to the public. 
might be a little bit of a misnomer to even call it that um, nationwide because of uh, sort of a patchwork approach, different um, between different organizations and the uh, pandemic laid those all very bare to us as, as practitioners in the, um, in the world of caring for patients and caring for communities. Um, so that is, you know, it's a situation we had to embrace and um, confront very directly in, in the heat of the battle, if you will. Um, and, you know, to help become public health departments, I'll be perfectly frank, in some of the areas we worked in or we work in, and to, if, if not be the de facto public health provider, uh, be the de facto uh, consultant to the public health entities with which we partner with um, on a routine basis. And, um, you know, I, I wish we would, were saying technology was an aid, but sometimes uh, in a lot of places, technology was a hindrance, or it just different modes and different models made it a, a real challenge for us to create, a, a again, that network or system uh, to support everyone uh, and to do our best. So, um, as, as any time you go through a big event, you, we are in the process now of analyzing and understanding what happened and what can be uh, changed. And that's, uh, I'll be honest, where the federal government is this, at this point. Um, there, there's sort of two distinct tracks taking place that I think are worthwhile uh, for our discussion here today. Uh, the first one is, I would say, there is active legislative uh, work being done on the uh, Senate side. Uh, the Senate Health Committee came out with the Pandemics Act in uh, the springtime. I, you know, it was it was all long rumored, um, between you know, should be released, and then it ultimately what uh, a little bit later than expected, but um, late May, a, a working draft was issued, and you know there are some key important themes there um, that are really becoming the guiding sort of. Uh, compass for these uh, discussions in the Senate. And they are really what the government, federal government does best in this situation, which is creating resources, creating uniformity, and when I, uh, and also providing funds. Um, and I will just caveat when I say government does best, I mean what it does most of the time, uh, not always qualitatively the best. but. Um, I, I think the key elements of the legislation right now are they are looking at overhauling the CDC structure to make it more responsive, more um, more of a partner and not as a sort of an outside observer to work being done at state and local levels. Um, also creating and improving programs for data collection and consistency of data collection across different jurisdictions and the information sharing. You know, it's all great if everybody has their own information, but until we can compare and compile, um, we can't get a, a true picture of what we're, uh, what we might be facing in the next pandemic. There's also a, um, a significant focus in the Senate legislation on creating networks of testing and epidemiological epidemiological tracking. Um, I, again, I think the COVID-19 experience uh, laid bare uh, the significant gaps and challenges in both of those spaces. So creating a, a, um, a strong program that is, can be adapted and nimble enough to address different challenges. Um, and then also, I think two really important themes are the disparities, the access issues, the different approaches to get to get information, to share information, how to reach different audiences, hard to reach audiences, and frankly, just speak in different ways with the same message so that multiple, you know, sort of creating that stereo or surround sound. Um, so it's not just one voice delivering messages, but really getting to 
uh, trusted voices, trusted sources, like uh, the first speaker was talking about. Um, and then last but not least, significant investments in mental health issues, which are, I think, going to be one of those long lasting areas of discussion when you when it comes to the pandemic and realizing that they are going to be public health challenges. They are not just going to be clinical um, moving forward. So that's the Senate bill, um, the pandemic acts. They are, they had hearings in late May and early June. Um, it was moving along pretty well. Everybody's expectation was is that in July, they, it could come up for um, actual floor consideration. Um, however, it has become sort of a, a negotiation shit with a lot of other issues going on. And just the situation has come to where uh, floor time in the Senate is very um, scarce right now. And frankly, the bandwidth and attention to move this type of legislation is um, limited right now with other uh, priorities. And honestly, the fact that um, there's still a lot of discussions going on. It's, this is a really interesting bill where it is very much forward looking and talking about where, uh, what can be done better. There is a, uh, a tranche of senators um, that are very interested in sort of conducting a post-mortem on the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is one of the areas that is still um, of interest uh, and negotiators are working on that right now of would there be a 9-11 style commission uh, chartered by Congress to investigate and come up with a lessons learned uh, analysis um, versus the all forward looking uh, type approach that this current bill has right now. So um, it's processing moving forward. All indications are that this something will happen in this space. Uh, the leading Republican on the committee is a gentleman by the name of uh, Senator Burr from North Carolina who's retiring and he sees this as one of his legacy pieces and is very motivated to get something passed before uh, retirement, uh, or before he, his retirement begins in November, or excuse me, December of this coming year after the elections. So again, that's sort of the immediate uh, active legislative angle. On the House side, they have taken a less aggressive legislative approach. I think they're sort of waiting to see what the Senate does. Um, and that's a whole institutional debate for another time. Um, but what I think is interesting on the Senate, or excuse me, on the House side is that a lot of uh, attention has been paid about pandemic preparedness uh, by what was, is called the Healthy Futures Task Force, which is a group of members from the healthcare legislative agenda, uh, legislative jurisdiction committees on the Republican side that are coming up with an agenda should the midterms result in a Republican takeover in the House. Um, and they have released a, uh, sort of a, a document, an overview of some of their approach to um, public health moving forward. And I would, it's very much, it, it's got definitely some different themes than what the Senate bill is working on right now. Um, this bill is very much focused on uh, increasing autonomy for local and state health agencies. So no avoiding situations where um, federal mandates would come out and um, everyone else would have to comply. I think there is a uh, ongoing theme of, you know, fear of federal overreach and managing local, managing pandemic responses more locally to meet the unique and specific needs of different communities. Um, and then also a lot of uh, increased transparency from CDC and NIH, uh, and even CMS to a certain extent, to support the, um, the release of data, the sharing of data, 
um, but making sure that it's complete or that caveats are more upfront than what some of the members thought was happening during the pandemic. Um, and a huge modernization of the strategic national stockpile. Like, you know, we all know of the uh, supply chain problems we've had over the year, two years now. And so talking about does the strategic na national stockpile actually have what we would need in a pandemic, how to make it more responsive and more usable for um, different types of healthcare providers. And then also um, two other things sort of focused on um, our ability to adapt and approach uh, future pandemics is first off promoting sort of the public-private partnership model of operation work speed for uh, creation of medical countermeasures and vaccines moving forward. And then also um, sort of onshoring or insourcing production of um, high value uh, technical products in the medical space so that they can, uh, we will not be at the whim of as many uh, supply chain challenges moving forward. So those are sort of the different themes on the House bill. Again, these are, are the House sort of priorities list, but this is for the Republican group, if they, or the Republican caucus, if they were to take over the um, House of Representatives in, after the midterm elections are wrapped up in November. So that's sort of the discussion. We continue to monitor all the, uh, the different uh, chats that are taking place and the give and take in different areas on the Senate side uh, as a way to inform them using the work that the um, Public Health Modernization Task Force uh, put into the work. And um, that's sort of where we're at right now. I'm happy to turn it over to Amanda and go from there. Yeah, thanks, Brad. A whole lot of moving parts and pieces for us to keep our eyes on for sure. Thank you. And we've got a number of questions coming in, both in the uh, Q&A and in the chat here. So uh, we'll take a moment to address some of those. Um, Craig, I'm going to start with you. We've got a couple of questions here um, regarding race and ethnicity data in the CRISP HIE. Um, so just to kind of combine um, Maggie and Sam's questions, A, how complete is the race and ethnicity data in the CRISP HIE? And how advanced is the um, ability to disaggregate with respects to examples like the Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander data? Yeah, those are good questions. So, um, so the data is pretty complete. Uh, that's partially because we just have such a, a diverse set of data sources. So we get data from claims, from real-time hospital encounters, from clinical encounters, um, and then from you know some of the public health feeds like lab results, which we all know don't have a ton of race and ethnicity data on them. Um, so, so we have pretty good completeness. Um, I think it's it's very much worth the caveat to say the data is only as good as it was when it was collected. And so our hospital association, I know, has been doing a lot of work on kind of the appropriate and sensitive and, and most you know, timely way to, to ask those kinds of questions to their patients, um, not make assumptions, uh, give people the, the ability to say they don't want to specify. Um, and so as usual, right, they garbage in, garbage out. Um, in terms of the actual level of data, um, so we have, I believe we have the five kind of minimum federal categories of race, race ethnicity. Um, so kind of the same problems that you experience in many places where you, you want to be more specific, we simply can't be. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, one of the, the long-term discussions that we all need to have is kind of at what level do we need to collect this data? Because there is a, a fine line between kind of burdening clinicians during the workflows um, and collecting, you know, uh, appropriate and detailed data. Um, so it, it's certainly better than nothing, but I, I think we have a, a pretty long way to go. Sure. Dr. McCalla, Brad, would either of you like to add anything to the discussion regarding just the importance of capturing and um, categorizing and handling race and ethnicity data? I would say that, um, 
when we're capturing data, it's important to look at the standardization of how we're capturing that data because that helps for comparability, whether it's comparability within organizations, between organizations or across state lines. I think issues, we need a collection of data from multiple sources, but it needs to be collected in a standardized fashion so that we can truly get a sense of the pulse of what's happening in those communities. Great. And speaking of communities, the next question that I have here from one of our attendees is, can you all provide some examples of how communities are changing the conversation from healthcare to health and how they're using data to do so? Um, I can speak to maybe a little bit of the technology side of it. I'm certainly not qualified to go deeper than that. Um, but so I, I think what we're seeing, and, and Maryland's a little bit unique in some of our um, kind of demonstration projects and our total cost of care model. Uh, but I think there are certainly demonstrations that are similar to what we do. Um, what we're seeing is that um, everyone in, in healthcare is much more focused on upstream causes of, of health and wellness with the understanding that uh, you can't solve everything at a sing single point in the care continuum and certainly not in the hospital. And so where uh, years ago, there maybe used to be a debate about kind of how you engage in the social determinants and other kind of, you know, non-healthcare, quote, non-healthcare aspects of, of wellness. Um, I think that's a given right now. And so the question then becomes, what are the appropriate ways to, to engage these other, you know, community-based organizations, uh, other, other community groups both with payment and privacy and kind of data sharing policies. Uh, these are very complicated, very long-term questions. Um, we're seeing a little bit of it as, as we, we have regional partnerships and we have a pathways program that's supposed to encourage more collaboration. Um, but again, this is a, these are hard questions. I can add that um, at the, the AAMC Center for Health Justice, we are really focused on multi-sector collaboration and just acknowledging that in order to truly affect public health, we have to look beyond medicine. And so we've actually assembled a multi-sector partner group of experts from 10 different sectors, um, law, education, transportation, housing, to really elevate the voices of the community, what they're hearing within their organizations and be able to help us at the center with our strategic planning and our priorities to make sure that we have the right people at the decision to make at the sorry have the right people at the table to make the decisions based on the data that we have available to us absolutely great thank you brad did you want to add to that yep Yep, yeah, thank you. And I, um, um, again, I apologize for not being able to be on screen. So I know it creates a different rhythm, but I, and I, I agree, you know, the, the, the trajectory is, is we've all finally embraced that so much of health is more than just social determ or is much more than what's happening in, in, a, in the exam room. And it's, it's that balance of creating, I think, really a system and a team approach. It's, um, Coming from the system perspective, I always have to be careful because I know if we overburden providers, they're going to become very set up with it's not their role to be involved in housing and nutrition, you know, access to good nutrition. But we can make it very, if we can simplify it for providers and their teams to connect their patients close to home or close to where they their needs are we can make a huge difference but it's that creating not and i'm in sort of a danger zone here of not creating a medical home within the clinical setting but creating a net medical network and a health network for everybody and that's where data comes in and it's it's understanding who are the good stakeholders who are the good partners nearby we we cover about forty thousand square miles the geographic size of the state of Maine from towns of 700 to 60,000 um, is about the biggest city in that neck of the woods. So we have to decide very early on how are we supporting different 
providers in different areas to be our partners um, and not just bringing it all in house and doing it ourselves because our my doctors wouldn't um, aren't, aren't going to embrace that. I'll be very honest. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So. Jumping back now to a uh, to a pretty big question, and I think we probably touched on a, a few components, but we had a question. If we fast forward to the next pandemic, what public health steps can immediately be implemented based on our recently learned experiences? I so I, this is Brad. I'm happy to jump in at the for a few thoughts. Um, and you know, I think right now we're sort of seeing the trickle. I'm not saying it's going to be the same, but it's there's some parallels with the evolution of monkeypox of understanding what it is, explaining the challenges and the risks around it, and then building a system to address it. And I think we're doing much better of. Uh, creating a network, at least from my experience and my conversations of developing the capacity for testing and education right away, creating unique ways to communicate about it to target audiences and, you know, the government taking an active and responsible role in terms of using its purchasing power, its market power to uh, ensure that there's adequate um, uh, antivirals and vaccines available uh, strategically. Um, we can do better. Um, we, there should always be even more integration, but um, you know, I think strong testing, strong communication, and strong surveillance right now is a different hallmark than what we experienced. Well, a few thoughts come to mind. For me, um, I think definitely capturing the appropriate demographic data that, that we would need to think about the appropriate aggregation of data, but also segmentation of data by important um, demographics. So whether we're thinking about race, ethnicity, location, or age, just understanding, again, painting the picture of what is the true issue within the population but also making the data more accessible to those key stakeholders. So those key stakeholders may be researchers, maybe policymakers that, that are responsible for, for new policies and decision-making. So um, not making access to data a barrier for those that need it. I'll agree with those points. And maybe kind of the, the continued thread between them is that if we invest in the right infrastructure and, and, and maintain the right infrastructure, I think it's very useful uh, both across pandemics and then for other things because uh, you know equity and access are not pandemic issues they're much broader issues um, i'll also there are a couple of questions in the chat regarding kind of national stand, standards and different frameworks and um, i think it's really important to find the balance between aligning with national standards um, we're, we're very supportive of you know the different national networks and the sequoia project and all the different things that are happening uh, with HL7 and, and certainly FIRE. Um, at the same time, though, we're not really willing to wait for national standards to dictate what to do next. I think we can, all the states and territories and probably areas within the states can all be incubators for innovation. And so there's, there's this really important balance between kind of understanding the direction of an administration and kind of skating to where you think the puck's going to be. Um, but also building useful, valuable services that can be deployed quickly and that can be kind of iterated upon. Um, and so we're, we're, like I said, firm believers in what's happening nationally, and we're very much aligned with them. Um, but also we're kind of willing to do our own thing and, and you know, share our lessons learned and, and certainly learn from others. And we have so many really good questions coming in. I wish we could take a lot more time to discuss them, um, but hopefully um, each of our panelists might include their contact information here if they're willing and interested to continue the conversation. So in our last five minutes or so, I would love to give each of our panelists um, an opportunity to share some closing thoughts and or if you've got um, some of the questions you see popping up that you want to address quickly, we'll take that as well.
I can start with, with um, something that I do want to leave. Um, just emphasize trustworthiness within communities and, and how important and how critical trust is to establishing partnerships, whether that's between organizations and communities or even between a patient and their provider. Um, I know Craig touched on the information that we put into the system is only going to be, um, I'm sorry, Craig mentioned that the information that we get out of the system is only going to be as good as information we put into the system. And so there has to be a level of trust um, that for the information you're, you're giving to someone that's going to be used appropriately, but also a level of trust in the person collecting in the information that is accurate. Um, and so I will drop in the chat up some principles of trustworthiness that the center has created just to help organizations start to have those discussions, those trust building discussions within their communities and within organizations and to determine local actions that can be demonstrated, that can be taken to demonstrate trustworthiness. And so just remembering that building trust between your community is going to be an important next step forward. Okay. Maybe I'll, I'll just quickly add, you know, I, I think the technology and the data is finally caught up with where we all want to be. Like we can do a lot of really neat things in terms of exchange and ag aggregation and, and data sharing. Um, there's a lot of work to be done uh, within data use and governance, making sure that public health systems are integrated and have the capabilities to share that data and that kind of the end users um, are accessing the data appropriately and that it all works within the workflows of you know, health departments, health officials, and clinicians. Um, and I think there's, there's probably a lot of different ways to do this, and I'm excited to see all the work happening. Uh, but it's certainly a lot of work as, as now we, we catch up. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's important. And uh, Brad, any closing thoughts from you? Sure. No, thank you. And I mean, I'm I, only building on the great observations of uh, my colleagues here, I would just say continuing to break down the silos where uh, each person does their own thing is uh, not the way uh, to create that true system and a true uh, uh, multifaceted approach to care, uh, whether it be in pandemic or just uh, the usual, um, whatever that is these days. But I think continuing to build a, full, a multifaceted system is the way we're finally going to start talking about health um, and it's going to pay dividends in a number of different ways. Absolutely. All right. I want to thank each of our panelists for being here and sharing with us today and each of our attendees for joining and um, look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you so much.